afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Allie Ferguson. I'm with the Scattergood Foundation and do project management for Think Bigger, Do Good. Um, we are here this afternoon uh, for the webinar, Judicial Threats to Olmstead and the Americans with Disability Acts. Um, we're gonna get started. I just wanna note that this is being recorded. Uh, everyone is on mute. Uh, please use the Q&A function, which we've had um, some great chatter and help from uh, attendees already. So thank you for that. And all of this will be provided to you as a follow-up email. So we'll have the recording link and all the materials, including slides um, available, a brief uh, feedback survey that we would uh, love for anyone to take and provide us feedback. Um, and with no further ado, oh, I'll give you a little bit of background on just uh, Think Bigger, Do Good. So we are a funders collective. You'll see the four foundations here, Pegs, Patrick P. Lee, uh, Peter, and Elizabeth Tower Foundation and the Scattergood Foundation, who've worked together to create um, this policy series around uh, mental health and substance use uh, policies. And uh, which has resulted in a, about 30 papers written on different topics uh, with the, our editor, Howard Goldman, um, and a slew of wonderful authors, too, who you will meet um, in a moment that have contributed to this series. It can be found at thinkbiggerdogood.org. And I also want to um, take a moment to thank Psychiatric Services and their partnership, which allows us to have a wider audience and benefit from uh, some of their editorial um, groups and advisory. And uh, we both provide, you know, have mutual uh, providing of content to each other. And it really makes this series, uh, takes it to the next level. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna do a brief introduction of the two speakers and our moderator today. Um, and you'll send, they'll, they'll have their full bios sent out in the packet um, of information afterwards, but I'm just going to kind of share some highlights of their very distinguished careers and uh, keep it uh, short versus reading their whole um, bio. So first we have Jean Mangan. Uh, she's a legal writing instructor at the University of Georgia School of Law. Uh, there she teaches legal writing courses and supports the school's bar preparation efforts. And one of the highlights of her work and role there is that she's actually written and created um, several open education resources for her students um, to use to prepare. Um, she had also served um, as the first staff attorney of the Will Banks Child Endangerment and Sexual Exploitation, Exploitation Clinic. Um, and she was the first to try to verdict a case uh, filed under the Hidden Predator Act where she um, you know, did that and successfully mediated several other cases. Um, she has a background of working um, in judicial district courts as well and civil litigation. And then we have Andrea Dennis. She is the Associate Dean of Faculty Development and the John Bird Martin uh, Chair of Law at the University of Georgia. Uh, prior to the University of Georgia, she was at University of Kentucky and University of Maryland where she taught. Um, she'd been an assistant federal public defender in the District of Maryland as well. Um, and her scholarship explores um, criminal defense lawyering, race, criminal justice, criminal informants, and co corroborators, youth advocacy, legal um, socialization of the youth in the cradle to prison pipeline. And she is the author of a book, Rap on Trial, Race, Lyrics, and Guilt in America, which has received national attention and courts nationwide have cited the research on lyrics um, as criminal evidence. And then finally, our um, last but not least, I should say, Jane McGavro is the executive director of Patrick P. Lee Foundation, um, which is a foundation in Buffalo, New York, dedicated to supporting organizations um, that have positive impact in the areas of mental uh, our medical care, research, education, human community services, and behavioral health. Uh, Jane, prior to that, was uh, the director of client relations at the Community Foundation of Greater Buffalo and has had uh, many other roles within philanthropy and uh, nonprofit advancement. And I have to say that Jane has been a tremendous colleague and support of the Think Bigger, uh, Do Good uh, initiative, and I am always grateful for her uh, support on many, many things. Um, 
So I'm going to hand it over to Jane and uh, let her take it from there, work on some of these tech issues and uh, be pretty quiet in the background unless I'm needed. Um, thanks, Ellie, for those introductions and welcome, Andrea and Jean. It's good to see you both again. I'm really excited to be with you today and I look forward to the discussion ahead. It will be noted on the slides, but I want to remind all our guests that Andrea and Jean are not providing legal advice and anything shared are their own opinions and not those of the University of Georgia Law School. So with that, let's get started. Our goal today is to discuss some of the legal protections afforded to people living with mental illness and or substance abuse disorder and the role of government agencies to ensure compliance. After we go through some of those background foundational information, we're gonna consider how these legal protections might be impacted by cases currently before the Supreme Court. Um, Jean and Andrea, let's just start with the paper. So you begin by discussing the American with Disabilities Act of 1990 and the Olmstead decision of 1999. Can you help us set the stage for some of us who, even if we are lawyers, it might be a while since we had looked at these um, cases and to sort of help us understand the impact that they have in our work. Sure. So the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, came about in 1990, and Olmstead is a case in 1999 where the United States Supreme Court said um, that you cannot institutionalize people if they can be in a community care setting. And they laid out some specific things that you have to consider in Olmstead, it's actually in Georgia, go Georgia, I guess, um, two folks, two women were um, voluntarily institutionalized and then uh, were like, okay, we're ready to go now. And the state said, no, we're not going to provide you services in the community. Um, and so because of Olmstead and then the Department of Justice, they integrate, got the integrated uh, care mandate, which a lot of people use in a lot of different cases. So that's kind of where we're starting. And the idea is that Olmstead sets a, a precedent for states you can't consider just finances. You actually have to have other reasons why you are um, keeping people separate from the community. Great. So those cases are kind of old, but there's even a case that predates that that sort of helps set the stage for Olmstead and how it is played out today. Is that correct? So. Um, if I'm right, the Chevron um, case, which actually involved the Environmental Protection Agency, of, and this is in 1984. So help us just get our head around how does an EPA case impact the work that we're doing in mental health and, and how does this all tie together? Absolutely. And Jane, what I'm actually going to do is go ahead and put this full timeline on the screen. These are all the cases that are mentioned in our article. We're not going to talk about all of them. Don't worry. No flashbacks to law school. but when you look at 1984 Chevron, this was essentially saying, okay, can the EPA's decision on how to implement a statute, what kind of say does that get if it gets challenged in court, right? So we have statutes that say what different agencies need to do, but oftentimes Congress leaves the how to do those things to the agencies with their rules and regulations. 1984 in Chevron, they said, listen, you do have to defer to what the federal agency that was tasked with providing the service from the statute, you have to give what they said, the benefit of the doubt. I think of it as like, you start off with a touchdown um, at the beginning of a football game kind of thing. So that's 1984 Chevron. Um, and how that ends up mattering is that, for instance, in Olmstead, what we really have for the integration care mandate is that's coming from a regulation that was issued by the Department of Justice. It's actually not found in the Americans with Disabilities Act. So when we're saying how do we actually implement what Olmstead stood for or stands for and what the ADA requires, a lot of what we're relying on is a regulation. So, so that is really helpful in, in setting the stage. So Chevron happens, there's this deference to executive administrative agencies to sort of help when there's ambiguity, right? So there's something unclear, they're gonna help 
the community courts agencies figure out how to actually enact it. But there's been, and I can see on this timeline, a lot of cases that maybe have have impacted how Chevron has has come into play. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about um, some of these decisions that maybe have chipped away a bit or have have changed the sort of way that we are looking at Chevron. Yes, absolutely. So I'm not, again, not going to talk about all the cases. The blue cases are ones that have us address what kind of deference is going to be provide, provided to agencies. And then our cases in red are cases that show how the Supreme Court, particularly recently, so you see 2018, 2020, and 2022, how they have looked at a statute and an agency's decision on how to proceed forward and what kind of guidance the United States Supreme Court or what kind of clarity they're expecting in a statute to decide whether they enforce it. So um, I'm just checking to make sure I'm not stepping on any toes here about how we're doing this. Um, so you'll see that in Bostock in 2020, that's a Title VII um, discrimination case. But what happens in there is that Gorsuch, who was writing, Justice Gorsuch writing for the majority, essentially said, the statute is so clear what we have to do here that we are going to say you discriminated on the basis of sex. That we don't have room to go somewhere else. Whereas with Masterpiece and with Dobbs, because things were a little squishier, the court had more room to decide how it wanted to read things. So then we get to Loper Bright and Relentless, which I'm gonna let uh, my colleague Andrea chat more about. Um, and then maybe circle back to a current case happening in Georgia right now. So Andrea, before you jump in on that, can you just maybe give a little context of, of what those cases that um, Jean just mentioned are? So. I've heard about the cake shop case I, at a high level. I think a lot of us were following it, but maybe not not for the reasons that you're about to talk about. And then also just um, with Bostock and Dobbs, just to make sure that we're all on the same page of, of those, and then you can dive in for us. Yeah, no. So um, again, thank you everyone to being here. This is an immensely complex uh, legal situation, and we are working to do our best not to be down in the legal weeds and minutia and use all that legal jargon, because we know we have a mixed audience here of legally trained and people who know a little bit about the law and people who may know very little. So um, if we're, we're seem a little bit hesitant in how we're trying to communicate, that's why. So Masterpiece Cake Shop and Dobbs um, are relevant for the reasons Jean already said, right? Those are decisions that also involve um, understanding the limits of agencies' abilities and the amount of deference or Chevron deference that might have to be given to them. I'll also talk in a moment about why they're relevant um, separate and apart from that, um, because um, part of the concern here is that this whole line of cases and the loper and relentless dis uh, decisions that will be issued this year um, might create a large amount of unpredictability. Unpredictability for you all, our audience. Lawyers too, right? But most importantly, um, for the audience, um, which includes um, clients and patients and service providers and advocates and agency administrators and lawyers um, representing any of those groups, right? So, um, the reason I say unpredictability is because Gene has laid out to you, right? We have this long history of cases. We have this long history of deference to administrative agencies. It's not until Bostock, as Gene said, that we begin to see the court saying where it's quite clear what Congress or a lawmaking body, body meant. We're not engaging in any interpretation, right? That's clear. In Masterpiece Cake Shop, which involved... Um, this is often called the bakery case. If some of you might have heard about the bakery case from the Supreme Court, this was um, a uh, bakery in Colorado, which was apparently well-known and well-liked in the community and made fabulous um, cakes for all sorts of events, was approached by a same-sex couple and wanted to have a cake made for their wedding. 
Um, and the baker refused to do uh, the cake on the grounds of religious perspective. And the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, so a state agency, uh, essentially found the bakery to be in violation of Colorado's um, statutes prohibiting, dis prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, and so the question became how much deference had to be owed to the Colorado Civil Rights Commission's decision. Um, was their decision violating First Amendment rights to freedom of religion? Right. And so this is another one of these instances that Jean talked about where we're talking about agency decision making in a very different context, but it is still agency decision making. Dobbs is similar, and many of you have heard of this case, um, which concerns um, abortion uh, and reproductive access and Roe versus Wade. Right. And so ultimately what became presented in um uh, Dobbs is whether or not Roe versus Wade was going to be overturned. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's the context. And the reason we now are concerned is that Loper um, and Relentless, which are both before the Supreme Court, are specifically going to address this question of Chevron deference um, and right agency decision making. Uh, and so um, what we have also seen and we'll talk about is this is interesting, right? It's a lack of deference to prior Supreme Court decisions. There's what we talk about is precedent, right? Where the Supreme Court has issued decisions in the past and the law seems um, um, settled, right? The Supreme Court is unlikely to overturn precedent. It will follow precedent, right? The, what we see though, in especially in Dobbs, is the court willing to overturn precedent. Uh, and so what that might mean in Loper and Relentless is that the Supreme Court will be willing to overturn Chevron. So deference to Chevron, right? So Chevron deference might go away in whole or in part. All right. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, let everyone process that for a moment. And then I think Jane's going to come back in with a question and Jean might have something to add in as well. So thanks, Andrea and Jean. I you know, was a, I'm excited about this topic because I think what what our group should be thinking about is these cases that may seem like they don't really apply to us actually do because the tenants of them, right? Who makes the decision or who gets preference in their their interpretation of something when it's not clear? And I think that's a really um, any of us who have read some of these laws that are coming out there. There's a lot of ambiguity at times as to what that looks like in real life, and so. Right, historically, we've relied on this expectation that the courts will say this agency knows more right, than, than maybe we do on this specific topic. So we're gonna trust that they have the expertise to do that. Um, and so, you know, when you talk about the bakery case um, and the um, Dobbs, it seems like, well, that wouldn't matter to us, but it, it really does. Um, so thank you for helping us understand just sort of for the lay person, why those things, we should be paying attention to all these things. Um, so you've talked about some recent cases um, that are before the Supreme Court right now, and it's Loper and Relentless. But because I talked to you ahead of time, I know we're gonna focus on Relentless, right? Because not all of the justices will be weighing in on Loper. Is that correct? Yes, but actually I think also, um, Jean is gonna highlight even more a current case, which- oh, great which brings all of these um, cases that she and I have talked about, literally, I, we were we were both happy and distressed to find this, right? One case that really does bring it into this particular context. So Jean's gonna lay that out. So now that we've talked about all these other things, let's get to talking about ADA Olmstead specifically and how is that working as mental health providers and policymakers right now? In January of this year, there was a class action lawsuit filed in the Northern District of Georgia against- Again, Georgia, I'm so sorry. Thanks for Look, we're here to keep morning. your life interesting. Yeah, um, so filed against the Georgia Department of Community Health, the Georgia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, and against the uh, Department of Family and Children's Services for not providing appropriate community-based care for children who are in DFAX custody and receiving Medicaid. 
So the idea is just like we had back in 1999, we're seeing people are being institutionalized. They're not being put into community-based settings where they can receive the best quality care. When you read through the four different plaintiffs that are outlined in this case, they are, they are children. We're talking 14 and younger. Um, they will be institutionalized and then they are released back home with a prescription and a recommendation to follow up with a therapist. Unsurprisingly, they end up institutionalized again because they're not being provided adequate support. So that's a situation that factually likely all of y'all are far more familiar with than I am. Um, but where this comes back to what we've been talking about is when you look at this complaint, you'll see that one of their causes of actions is that the defendants had an obligation under Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act to provide community-based services rather than institutionalizing. I mean, they needed to also make it possible for people to be stable in those community-based placements. When you look at this count, you will see, and I will tell you, that they rely on the language in Olmstead, and then they specifically say, in promulgating regulations to implement the ADA, the US Department of Justice has required that Georgia and other states administer services, programs, and activities in the most integrated setting appropriate to the needs of qualified individuals with disabilities. Now, my guess is that language sounds really familiar to you guys. Um, and probably also does the definition of integrated setting, which is enables individuals to interact with non-disabled peers to the fullest extent possible. Well, those are both regulations. Those are something that is put out not by statute, but is put out by an executive agency. What deference are going to be given to those definitions if someone were to find that the statute is ambiguous, what is discrimination? And do we go ahead and still rely on what the DOJ has said an integrated setting means? I will tell you that the United States filed a case against the whole state of Mississippi last year. A uh, Fifth Circuit said, nope, uh, you actually don't have to give Chevron deference to anything that comes out of the DOJ. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth right now on how much deference you give to these different definitions that we're used to working with. Um, and back to the how, right? So as practitioners and advocates, your goal is how do we take care of people? How do we make sure they're accessing their mental health services? How do we make sure that they're being treated as full human beings, right? We rely on these regulations to tell us what we can and cannot do. But if the deference goes away in Chevron, it opens up the door and we're already seeing knocking at this door of do we also allow all these other things that we've had since Olmstead to stay in place as being something we can rely on when we want to make states provide what they should. And then one more thing, because I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole, is that Brian Kemp, yay Georgia governor, actually filed an amicus brief in Loper Bright and Relentless and said that Chevron deference interfered with the state's ability to provide Medicaid on its terms. So we're already seeing the, the lines being drawn. So let me just jump in and add two points here that I think um, are also interesting, right? Um, we are not here to be partisan, politically partisan, or offer any perspective, depending on your particular role, depending on any particular circumstance. It, you might think the law will be favorable to you in one way or another, right? So states who say we want to eliminate Chevron deference, it's because they want to have more authority at their level rather than right, being constrained by the federal government. But this question of agency deference still applies even if we're talking about state-based agencies and lawmakers, state lawmakers and their relationship to their state-based um, agencies and then state court judges, right? So all of this happens on both the federal level and the state level. Um, so there, there's an added level of unpredictability, right? Because we have ADA, a federal statute, we have state, we have the federal agencies offering some regulate, regulation, you have state agencies 
offering regulation. Um, and then you've got, you know, courts and um, executives, presidents and governors, or a president and governors, right? So there's a level of unpredictability there, both within your jurisdiction. And so by that, I mean, wherever you're practicing or advocating or working, there's a level of unpredictability on the federal level as well. Um, and we've got a couple more legal aspects we want to cover, but I think it's important to understand it's not just unpredictability and about how you're going to do your job and serve your clients, right, um, or administer your programs. It's also a question of disparity and equity, because um, as Jean mentioned, right, we've been talking about fifth, um, excuse me, Georgia cases. So you might think, well, that just applies in Georgia. Sure, right. Um, but think about every place where all of our audience comes from. If there are different decisions and approaches, that leads to unpredictability. You all might have differing, you, your conversations with each other might be difficult because if you're in Georgia and someone else is in California, the approach might be very different. The other point, Jean mentioned the Fifth Circuit. She's referring to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, so a federal appellate court which covers Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas, right? There are other circuit courts that cover other um, groups of states. So for us here in Georgia, it's the 11th circuit, right? Folks up north, it might be the first or the second circuit. Out west, the ninth and the 10th circuit. Up midwest, seventh circuit. And so all of those courts are also going to be issuing opinions, um, which means disparity, right, and a lack of equity, right, again, because an individual in one jurisdiction might get the benefit of one level of treatment, right, as compared to someone in another jurisdiction would get completely different treatment. So we're talking legal unpredictability, administrative unpredictability, um, disparity and inequity between individuals or service providers across the nation. So I'll stop there. Yeah, so I think that's a great way to sort of lead into sort of, so you're talking about current cases, you're talking about what's happening, you know, across the different states. So the Supreme Court, right, just heard arguments around, and we keep talking about Relentless and Loper, and we'll we'll give a little more context, I think, on those, but um, they just had the oral argument. So when we say that this conversation is timely, like, and Jean, thanks for reminding me about that Georgia case, you had mentioned it, and then I got New York focused and forgot all about it. So that's, but it really, it's affecting all of us at the same time at different places, right? So so what does this mean? So now that there's a case in front of the Supreme Court and it's it's relentless and you even um, in some of your slides, and I don't know if you want to get to those yet, but talk about the sort of composition and how the court, the Supreme Court has changed and why some of these cases like Chevron, right, 40 years old, should be settled law, we would think, you know, aren't. And so I don't want to jump ahead of where you want to be in the conversation, Andrea and Jean, but like I thought it was really interesting to see just sort of the evolution of the court. And again, not in a partisan way is the conversation, but just understanding how the mindset has evolved um, as they approach these decisions. Oh, so you're muted, Andrea. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Jean and I, we were joking, we had fun. This is this is arts and crafts for lawyers, right? How we could make this visually um, appealing and informative, right? And so this slide does a little bit of what Jean has done with the timelines, but now it's focused on um, essentially uh, who was the president or who was the executive at the time, for example, of the ADA, right? Enactment in 1990 by Congress, Right. And then so I'll just I'll just start there. Right. So on my screen left and hopefully your screen left, you see. Right. It was the ADA was passed under um, President Bush. Right. Bush one. Right. Um, and it was passed by um, overwhelmingly. Right. So overwhelming bipartisan support. Right. Three hundred and seventy seven to twenty eight. Right. So overwhelming support for enactment of the um, Americans with Disabilities Act. And so I'm starting there because that's the core statute that we're all dealing with, right? Remember, Chevron came prior to the ADA, right? And so um, the top graphic represents how the justices voted in Chevron. So again, remember, Chevron's our EPA case, EPA administration, right? And so at the time, this was the composition of the bench. Those who are um, 
their picture is bright and you can see them clearly voted in the majority and those whose pictures are shaded out voted in the minority, right? Um, and in fact, though, there were several justices here, I think, um, who might not have been um, permitted to vote, uh, to participate in those cases. But so it says unanimous decision. Um, so these uh, six justices agreed, right? The other justices would have had to recuse themselves for some reason. But so they voted, right, in favor of Chevron deference. So bottom is Olmstead, right? Again, this is our um, Supreme Court interpretation of the ADA in requiring uh, or prohibiting agencies from only looking at finances to determine placements requiring community care over institutionalized care when appropriate. So now you see there's a change in the bench, even just 15 years later, right? So again, just a reminder, right? Um, uh, the justices whose pictures are vibrant voted in the majority, and then those whose um, pictures are shaded a little bit voted in the minority. Um, and so you see here, you can you can just see, right? You've got added to the bench 15 years later, you've got Thomas, right? You have Ginsburg, um, who else is notable here? Uh, I should have a bigger screen here, bigger view of this. Scalia. Yep, Scalia. <laughs> right? Um, so what we wanted to begin to suggest here, and it got left out of the paper, we had word limits, and we thought this was a great part, so this is why we're explaining it to you here, right? Is to understand, right, the, this is the point that this is not partisan, right? At least from our perspective, right? Um, there was significant agreement that the ADA should be enacted, right? There, at, in light of an understanding Chevron deference, which had already been decided, right? Olmstead comes along and reinforces ADA and that the Department of Justice can, would be allowed to administer, to offer regulations, which it did, all right? Um, okay, so fast forward one. All right, so then the question becomes, if we fast forward to what's happened recently, and remember we talked about Masterpiece and Bostock and Dobbs and how they, right, um, offer this possibility that the Supreme Court will reverse its opinion on Chevron deference, so deference to agencies. The question is, again, why might that be? Masterpiece does talk about agencies. Bostock is about agencies, right? Dobbs is about state authority. So Masterpiece, we've seen uh, now a major transition. Now we're talking 20 years after Olmstead, a major transition in the court. Right now you have Sotomayor, Ginsburg's still there, right? Um, you have uh, Kagan is new, right? You have Roberts as the chief justice is new, Gorsuch, right? Alito, Thomas is still there, right? So in Masterpiece, remember the bakery case in which the Supreme Court, right, said that um, the Colorado State Agency, right, which found that there was discrimination, right? The Supreme Court reverses and says that the free expression rights, the religious rights of the baker, essentially, for lack of a, a better way to phrase it, right, are paramount, right? The baker cannot be forced to make a cake for the same-sex couple. The state agency cannot force them or penalize them if they don't do that, right? So major shift in the court between the time of Olmstead and Masterpiece. Major shift from Chevron to Masterpiece. Bostock, Two years later, right? There's um, still some some change in the court, right? Even though it's only two years later, there's still a little bit of change, right? Kavanaugh is now on the bench, right? Yep. And so he's the the newest the newest member, right? And so in Bostock again, right? Um, the Supreme Court, right, is saying essentially the legislative um, Congress's uh, enactment was clear. So that is paramount, right? So this is the, where we begin to see if there's no ambiguity in what Congress or your state lawmaking agency, I'm sorry, state lawmakers, legislative body have done, the court has to full stop, all right? So two decisions within two years of each other. Then you get Dobbs. And again, right, this is the abortion case, right? Whether or not Roe versus Wade is going to be overturned, right? Um, and so here you go, right? Six to three, right, to overturn. And again, remember I, I pointed out this concept of precedent, right? 
the justices have long adhered to this notion of precedent, which means that they will not reverse or overturn prior decisions the vast majority of the time, right? And so for those, right, so for those who thought that um, Dobbs, uh, you know, well, Roe versus Wade, it's on solid footing, it's existed, right, for 40 years or 50 years, right? The Supreme Court says, yeah, sorry, no, there is no right to abortion. So what this is about is not about abortion. This is the willingness of the Supreme Court to reverse prior decisions. And so for us, that's reverse Chevron, right? Maybe when it happens, it's already trickling up, reverse Olmstead, right? So even a significant change in the court can be a factor, right? So now you have the current um, bench, which has changed again, right? And only a, a couple more years later, right? You now have Katanji Brown Jackson, Amy uh, Coney Barrett, right? New, right? Um, and so the question is now when these issues of Chevron deference are directly presented, which is what the Supreme Court's going to decide this term, and in the future, if, when issues about Olmstead are presented, how will the court rule? So, um, what actually happened, I think I should have flipped these, right? So Loper was, uh, uh, the court's willingness to hear Ro Loper was granted first, right? Um, and then along comes what we call a companion case. Someone filed the case in Relentless, asked the court to hear that. And the court said, okay, great. We're going to hear Loper and Relentless. They're on the same issue, which is what will happen with Chevron deference, right? And so um, they're both have been argued together. And we'll tell you where you can go if you want to follow what happened there. Um, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson can participate in one and not in the other. That's an interesting circumstance. I will let the Supreme Court figure out how they work that out, right? Um, but she was sitting on a lower appellate court at the time of Relentless, right? So she is recused from Relentless. No, the other way around. Yes. Okay. Jean's got me. Okay. She was recused from one of them. There you go. We'll just <laughs> the point is she's recused from one of them. Loper. She will not issue a decision. She will not vote in that one, but she will vote in relentless. So again, whether those have the one opinion, same results or two different opinions, we can't predict. But so it's interesting to think that she's on one, not on the other. The bench has dramatically changed in the last, well, since, since 84. Right. And so what does that mean? And what we would say here is while much of the conversation in the country is about um, the Supreme Court and its legitimacy and the partisanship or the lack of partisanship and the political ideologies, right, there's also a question of legal philosophy and approach, which affects how the justices might decide. And so we're not going to weigh, we're not going to like laden you with conversations about legal philosophy and methodology. Um, but just understand it's not simply about partisanship politics. It may also be about legal philosophy and methodology and approach as well. So I- I'm sorry, Jean, anything else to add there? I, I think I've covered, I think I've tried to cover the big points. We have to leave time for questions too. We still do have one more slide and Jane's got more questions. I'm gonna let Jane go, I'm sure. Yeah. No, I, so, so I, you know, really love the sort of history and how the court has evolved and why this does directly impact all of us. And I will admit to of listening, I won't say I listened to all the oral arguments because that would be disingenuous, but I did catch the highlights. And um, to your point about it not being partisan, what was interesting is um, Justice Barrett actually said, if we go forward with what you're proposing, what would that mean for these previous cases? Like all this all these cases have been decided based on Olmstead and based on um, the reliance of these, you know, agencies sort of having um, deference. And so I think it is in the back of their minds that there, there will be big implications for this decision. It's not just about, right, the case before them. It's how will, you know, what would that mean? And she said there could be a flood on, on litigation. There could be, like, the courts could be overwhelmed. And so, um, it is far reaching, you know, these cases that are before the court right now. And, um, you know, I don't know that it's clear maybe if how far they would go, or maybe it will just kind of chip right away at some of these things that we're relying on. Right. So also to, to reinforce Jane's point, yes, the court could completely overturn Olmstead, 
Um, I'm sorry, not Olmstead. Sorry. Woo, 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 woo. No, no. <laughs> delete that. Everybody delete Whoa. that from your memory right now. That's not presented. The court could completely overturn Chevron or, right, chip away at it, roll back, which creates also a level of unpredictability, different unpredictability, but that's still problematic. So whether they overturn Chevron or chip away at Chevron, whether they issue a new standard, whether they go back to an old standard, all of that creates a level of unpredictability, potential um, inequity and disparity. Yeah. So hopefully no one's panicked sitting on this call, but we are really concerned about what we can do and what as advocates and family members and community members, like, you know, what advice would you give this group as to to how do maybe, you know, codify um, some of these these principles that we've relied on um, that, you know, may or may not be around um, in the future? Okay, um, so we've got, I think, some advice um, here. We, these are what we think are relatively, right, um, accessible. I won't say easy, but they are, right, everyone here can to do one of these. Um, and maybe if there's a question or time, you know, uh, Jean or I could talk a little bit more about litigation, but we're, we're not even going in that space right now, right? So if you want to just keep learning, right, so screen left, right, publicly available. You can go to supremecourt.gov. And you can find um, oral arguments, particularly from Relentless and Loper, if you want to listen to them. You can find transcripts if you would rather read a transcript, right? Um, you can find all the briefs, not only the briefs that were filed by um, the, the litigants in the case, but all of what we call amicus briefs, friend of the court briefs. So lots of other organizations um, weighed in. So if you really want to dive down um, a rabbit hole because you just want to learn more about the Supreme Court, you love the Supreme Court, um, you can go there. SCOTUS blog um, is a uh, is not a government entity, but it is reliable, right? It is a reliable entity that we in the legal field will look to, um, as it suggests. It's a blog about the Supreme Court. And if you go there, you can find um, postings that will relate just to Loper and Relentless. They will also give you access to all of the filings as well. Those are all public records. So they will also give you links to um, get documents, right? But they'll also have blog posts. So some uh, opinion writers or essayists will talk about these cases, um, uh, what might be at issue, what happened in the Supreme Court oral argument. So you can go to SCOTUS blog if you don't want to dive down into the government website. Oyes.org or Oye.org is another um, organization. This is um, uh, more of a nonprofit educational um, uh, organization. And it's a cool website because you can go there. And again, um, in a very, in a much more, even more accessible way, we'll give you a quick, you know, this is the issue in the case. This was the holding in the case. And those lovely graphics we pulled about how the justice voted, those came there. Um, and so you could even dive down into some of the other cases that we looked at. Um, you just put the, the name of the case in that you want, um, depending on when the case was decided it will give you uh, oral arguments. So there, if you want to just keep learning, right? Um, I'm going to go to the middle here, consult legal counsel. Many of you probably have access to, whether it's because they're in your agency, um, so you have agency counsel or you've got um, outside counsel for any um, um, service providers or not-for-profits, um, or maybe you have inside in-house counsel, talk to them. If they're not thinking about this, you might want to just poke them and say, hey, have you been thinking about this and following along? Because I just heard this webinar and this could be a problem. So make sure it's on their radar. Um, and in particular, if you work with the agency and you need to actually consult them for legal counsel, you should do that. That's part of their job. Um, right. So we can go sort of right, identify and elect supportive lawmakers. So I do, it's important to identify and elect, right? Identify means, right, whomever's going to be up for governor or judge, judges, right? Um, uh, whoever gets to make those appointment of agency heads, right? Um, lawmakers, legislators, whoever gets to enact laws, right? So, and I'm talking all three branches here, identify people who are running, ask them questions, right? Send them questions, figure out where they might stand on this issue, if they even know about it, right? Um, and then, you know, vote, right? Vote consistent with whatever you think is supportive for your particular perspective. Um, you can also lobby lawmakers. So those elected officials already seated, right? You can call them, you can write them a letter or an email, 
right? If you are in a position where you, you could be asked to give testimony, right? Please, right? Um, give, give testimony. They need input to hear from people on the ground, right? About how this might work and how this might affect on the ground. Um, they otherwise may not know that, or you don't want them to only hear from certain um, constituents and groups and not others. Um, and then if you're in an organization that can write a white paper or a report, right, that can also be sent to lawmakers. Um, and so we're all permitted to do that. Call, email, phone, write, testify, if called to, walk the halls, all those things. And then the last one is educate and ally, right? So again, along with these, right, with different ways to self-educate and figure out what's going on, right, you can ally with organizations. I know... Um, it might seem overwhelming, like, right? How do you even get your voice heard in this context when there are so many different issues and agencies and people? Um, and so your organizations or entities can ally with other organizations. And so I've I've identified um, several here. The one thing that might have become apparent but was not set out right is in many respects, this is also a civil rights issue. So it might be a disability issue, but civil rights organizations are also particularly concerned here as well. Those are the ones who right, right, and enforce compliance with anti-discrimination statutes. So they're involved in this. Um, so two prominent organizations which filed amicus briefs, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, um, and then the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. Also here, this sort of weird thing where I've got these bubbles and two groups circled, Bazelon, Center for Mental Health, and um, um, mental health uh, um, law program, national health. Anyways, I can't read right now. You you can read. Um, if you're familiar with them, great. If you're not, right, among a group of health providers, health-focused policy organizations, they filed briefs. When we looked through who filed all these amicus briefs, this was the only one I could find from healthcare, people in broadly in the healthcare um, field. And, you know, I highlighted the two that are particularly focused on mental health. But so if you can ally with them, right, the healthcare industry is particularly concerned about this and healthcare broadly, I mean, right? It's got implications for Medicaid, Medicare, as you heard. It's got implications for children in state custody. It's got implications for those in um, receiving services from any government agency. So educate and ally as best you can. So those are our bits of advice for things you can do now and that don't really take significant sophisticated legal ability and access. That's great. That's a good toolbox that you sort of armed us with. And I, I want to encourage people to put their questions in the Q&A. Um, and while folks are doing that, I will um, just sort of reiterate, because I think one of the takeaways I had here was with, is it Bostock? When it was clear, when there was no ambiguity, right, they are going to follow what the statute says. And so I think encouraging our lawmakers to to try and wordsmith and be as, as precise and um, you know exacting as possible could help remove some of these concerns that we're seeing things play out in the courts, right? So as much as that's realistic, I think maybe that was sort of a, a bright spot <laughs> um, in all this that you know the courts can't override what is explicitly put put in the statute. So um, we have a question um, from Mark. If the court ever revisited Olmstead, um, sorry, just pulled up. Um, what do you think the impact of homeless, homelessness in society would have on any legal decision of the court, assuming a general agreement that some homeless individuals suffer from mental health issues as well? Jane, you go first. I have I have a <laughs> thought. This I'm is a great one, so. this is a great question, Mark. Um, but so, Jane, you go first, and then I'll weigh in. Uh, yeah, I would just say that I think that the way that this court would actually look at things because they like to read very strictly, they want to see the black and white. Where is it written? Um, something to keep in mind is that you're not required to put people in community care settings if they don't want to be placed there. Um, they do, people do get to have a say as to where they go. And so, Mark, to the extent that your question is about, you know, is institutionalization the best option for those who are currently currently experiencing homelessness? Um, then that would be a different question. I mean, Olmstead really was trying to say that, look, just because 
you had someone in an institutional setting doesn't mean you can keep them there, particularly when a provider is recommending that they can leave and they themselves want to leave and there's somewhere for them to go and there's community-based care that can be provided. I don't know if that helps, but. Yeah, so I think that's one way to think about it as Jean, which is it's good that you went first because um, it reminded me too. again, we're talking about agencies, right? And HUD, right? HUD, right? Housing advocates are also concerned about this because it relates to what services they can or should or must provide or not. So I, I do know that um, uh, housing agencies, and by that I mean government agencies and, and NGOs, non-governmental agencies are concerned about this. I can also say because maybe you guys are happy you don't live in this world, but there is before the court um, literally also this term. It's a case called City of Grants Pass versus Johnson. Um, and the court is going to decide whether um, um, it, whether the Eighth Amendment protection against cruel and unusual punishment prevents a city from enforcing a ban on public camping against homeless individuals. So literally, this term, the court is also taking up a question about um, um, penalties and consequences, um, how um, jurisdictions can um, relate to, I'll use that term, um, homeless uh, populations and individuals who are unhoused. So I'm not saying that that decision will be immediately linked with any decision about Chevron deference, but notice sometimes the cases that the court is considering, right? And this is why we think the breadth of this issue right um is is so is so broad and so um uh, it'll be interesting you can also go to any of those supremecourt.gov uh, oh yay you can go to supreme go to blog and find out what's happening in that case again it's city of grants pass versus johnson or you can just like google like the homeless case supreme court 2023 um and it should come up and i will we will do our best to put the references of these cases into the materials that we send out to all the registrants so um, you know, Andrea did a good job of telling you resources to go to, but we will also try to supplement with um, the vast array of cases that we've touched on in such a short amount of time. Um, so we have a question from uh, Benjamin. How did the U.S. versus Florida in 2023 case regarding community integration of children with disabilities in nursing facilities affect your view of disability litigation? So I I think that the more that I look into this specific, um, how are people looking at disability litigation? What are we doing with the at risk of institutionalization, whether there was, or if there was actual institutionalization? Um, I think we're starting to see a circuit split. There's even a case that I was reading today that talks about how um, there are three circuits that see the at risk of institutionalization is sufficient to be able to bring um, an ADA claim and there's other circuit that says absolutely not, that's not enough. So while I, um, I think that we are seeing already that there's a lot of different ways that people can interpret what, how to implement the existing language and without any framework for kind of like Robert's rules of order, without any idea of how do we proceed forward, if more of those get taken away, we'll end up with, more just a wide variety of rulings that will at some point beg for an answer just don't know what that answer is going to look like Andrew, did you have anything on that one or did Jean cover it yeah no i think Jean covered it all and i just as she was talking i come back to my unpredictability i um i do think there's going to be a lot of litigation as the question was asked during oral argument, the Supreme Court actually is concerned about, right, uh, destabilizing the law such that it becomes a, um, a, both an administrative but also a judicial nightmare, to use a lack of a, a better term. They actually are concerned about that um, as one of their practical. But this is where I said, right, different philosophies, legal methodologies, right, come in legal policy, right? That is something that they also are concerned about. They don't want to, they don't want to open a floodgates that might eventually then just come back to them, you know, two years later, 10 years later. So that's a concern. So I think disability litigation is going to increase. It's going to be far more, I actually think it'll be more complex than it has because there's going to have to be so much expertise about 
all of these other decisions. And something else that's just relevant for, for Andrea and me, because we are in the, in the higher education setting, is that we're also seeing more students who are um, receiving, applying for, and getting accommodations to be able to be on an equal footing with their peers, to be able to take their, their testing and all that kind of stuff. And that also falls to an extent, right, in, in the ADA and in um, 504, the Rehabilitation Act, and, and even for K-12, you know, you've got your IDEA. So I, I think that we are going to see a lot of litigation around how do we do that, what, but because so many people are pocketed into, oh, well, I do Title III, I do Title III, I do Title VII, I do Title IX, we're going to find a lot of uh, different sets of rules that then we're going to figure out some way to make them cohesive. And we may find it will be a lot more difficult because we've been so siloed, which is another reason we're really mm. trying to encourage folks to talk to each other and be aware of what else is going on. This is the ally, right? Because right? We're concerned about higher ed, right? There are people who are concerned about K-12. There are people who are concerned about employment. So this is why I said also these groups, the civil rights groups writ large, right? Who are less wed to a particular context or a particular legal hook, but just broadly about civil rights and individual rights. That's another space to look at for, for allies. Yeah. I think, you know, and we're nearing time, but I think that's a great way to sort of to end too, that we, we do sometimes get siloed in our work and we maybe need to stop, you know, viewing it in such strict parameters because just like today, we've talked about the EPA and the First Amendment and that in all these cases are, are touching our work. And so um, sort of taking a step back, seeing where we have allies across the sectors, I think is going to be really important. And um, I think you began and we will end with like the unpredictability of things right now. So there's a lot happening. I mean, when I told Allie, like, this is the most time, just listened to the oral argument, like snippet, and like, it, it was so timely. And so I want to thank you both um for helping us try to get our head around it i would strongly encourage anyone on the call um read the paper it's available at thinkbiggerdogood.org um because it really you know they dug into some specific things here but it provides a more comprehensive sort of you know viewpoint and it's very approachable so you don't need a law degree to read that paper and understand sort of the implications to your work um and to our communities right so um, I don't know if Ali has some parting words for us too, but I, again, Jean and Andrew, this was a complex uh, topic to take on. And um, even looking at your slides, I, you know, law degree, you know, doesn't matter. Like this was just a lot to, to take in. So I think you guys did a great job of helping us um, have it resonate, you know, for any, any job out there, any sector out there. And so um, thank you both really for your time. Thanks great. for having us. Yeah, so I was just going to echo Jane's um, appreciation and thank you both and Jane for moderating, uh, moderating as well. Um, I will be sending an email um, with all of the links discussed today. We'll add the additional cases um, to to make it easy that weren't on the slides and came up in uh, questions and so forth. The video will be posted. It usually takes about 24 to 48 hours. So Will, I will, you will get the link in the email. And um, to your question, yes, please share everyone. Um, we'll also try to go back and have the closed caption um, added in on the YouTube file um, since we were having a glitch on that and sounded like from Zoom, the only way I could do it would be restart the whole thing. And I didn't want to risk that. So I apologize that that um, did not come off flawlessly. Um, and we will be in touch with uh, all of the follow-up materials, and uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions in the meantime.